And um, we've got Melvin Knapp from Kilgem up next. So Melvin, if you've, uh, you know, you've got a bit of extra time there, if, if you need it, you're talking about grey silverfish today. So a bit of a, a, a newish subject over the last year or so. Um, so yeah, if I could ask Melvin to turn his camera on and, and your mic, hopefully he's there as so we're starting a little bit early. Hello. There we go. There you are. I can see you now. Fabulous, fabulous. Great. Great. Well, I'll leave you to it, Melvin, and I'll let you um, talk about Brave Silverfish. Excellent. Good. Well, hello, everyone. Um, obviously, I can't see you. I normally like to be interactive with these things, but we'll uh, we'll do our best. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you now. Right, guys. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk to you about the Brave Silverfish. You might have heard a bit of information about the, or read a bit of information about the grey silverfish, um, which um, you might have read in PCN uh, News Magazine um, or uh, Pest Magazine. Um, so I'm going to kind of cover this because this is something that you may well have come across, but but not actually realised you, you you've come across it. So silverfish are all part of an order of insects um, that used to be called order Thysanera, but now it's called Zygentoma. So if you look in a book or in a training manual and, and you're told that silverfish and fire brats are all belong to, to Thysanera, well, it's probably time you bought yourself a new book or a new training manual because they were reclassified a few years ago as Zygentoma. And they're what we call primitive insects. Because with most insects, um, they evolved um, to have wings or their wings have evolved to be certain structures um, such as flies have a pair of wings and a pair of balance organs, halters, or beetles have a pair of wing sheaths and a pair of wings underneath those, those sheaths. Um, with the, these insects, these primitive insects kind of forgot to get on the, the bus as it were with, with evolution. They, they haven't changed for millions and millions of years and there's some some evidence that they've been around since the Devonian era, which is a sort of 419 million years ago. So there are a wingless, flightless, primitive insect that don't have any um, kind of additional features or structures that other insects would have had. They, the distinguishing feature with the bristletails is three long we call caudal filaments at back. Now you can't see too clearly that, but you'll see on my later pictures, the long filaments or appendages at the rear of the abdomen, okay? And this is where the name of bristle tail comes from. So we often refer to this group of insects as the bristle tail. And the, the old name that, or the old order of insects we used to group them in, Thysanra, was the Greek words for bristle tail. And that's why we call them the bristle tails. So they're, they're quite flat, long tapered, almost torpedo shaped, elongated body. And that means that they can hide away, cluster up in little cracks and crevices, gaps around tiles, under beneath um, loose wallpaper, skirting boards, um, get in cracks around boxing in, um, you know, pipe work boxing in bathrooms. So they're able to, to cluster away in small little cracks and crevices. And it's covered in tiny little silvery scales. Okay. Well, now the, the silver fish, it's not necessarily because of the silver scales, but when you see them move or dis disturb them, they kind of just kind of flitter along um, almost like a like a fish in water. So um, that's where the, the common name the silver fish comes from. Now, um, what they will do is generally scrape the surfaces of starchy materials. So they'll often scrape the surfaces of things like cotton, um, paper, wallpaper in particular. Um, they also need protein. Certainly the grey silverfish um, does require protein, animal-based protein in order to develop as well in their early stages. So they'll, often, they'll get that protein from things like glue, like certain adhes adhesives or book bindings. Um, certain glues that might be used to stick up, you know, aligning flooring uh, down on, on bathroom floor that might contain, you know, some animal protein in the glues. Um, and they've also got an enzyme in their, in their gut, which helps them break down cellulose. Cellulose is a material that many, many animals just can't digest and break down. But some insects such as termites, for example, and the silverfish are able to break down those kind of cellulose um, uh, materials as well. 
So that's the sort of damage that we can get from bristled tails on, on paper. So these are these are this is paperwork that's been stored away um, for for a considerable period of time in, in damp conditions. So these are the two bristle tails then that we are probably already familiar with. We've got the common silverfish, Lepisma saccharina, and then Thermobia domestica, the fire brat on the right there. And they're quite distinctive. So most of us would have already seen silverfish in our bathrooms or you know, if you've um, sometimes in the damp area of the kitchen, um, you disturb a little crack or crevice and they might, might flutter out. Um, the fire brat on the right will never really be found in the same area or environment that we would find the common silverfish. The fire brat, yes, it's found in areas of high humidity, but it requires high temperatures as well to thrive. So it's often boiler rooms, basements, um, those sorts of areas or where there's underfloor pipework or ducting, where that, that, that's obviously hot water pipework that's causing, causing the, the, the temperature rise there. And the fire brat is far more distinctive. It's got these kind of dull colored scales along its body. It's slightly larger as well and generally, but it's hard, you can't really go by the size because it depends on their stage of development. But we've got these buff colored scales um, on the dorsal side, certainly of the, of the fire brat there. So the gray silverfish, is a completely different species of silverfish, very closely related in the same group of insects, um, but there are some differences. Now, the first grey silverfish that was reported or recorded in the UK was found in a, an accommodation building in Reading in 2014. Um, and the person who found this um, was actually kind of studying insects, I believe. They were, they were already had a knowledge of insects. Um, and she happened to notice this unusual looking silverfish um, and identified it as Tenolopisma longicordata, the grey silverfish. And at that time, this silverfish had never been recorded in the UK. Um, so it's easily misidentified as either a silverfish or a fire brat, because it, it kind of looks a little bit, bit like each one of them um, in terms of its appearance. So it, it's easy, unless you've got a silverfish or a fire brat with you to, to pull alongside and compare, it is quite difficult to, to distinguish that with the naked eye. Another common name for the gray silverfish is the paper fish, all right, um, because it damages paper. But that's relevant. So other, other Bristle tails will do that as well. Um, the difference in this one, and this is why it's important to know the species we've got, because it may affect the decisions we make when we decide what control strategy we use, um, is that it thrives in, in situations of lower levels of humidity. The early stages, um, the very early uh, uh, immature stages, do require high levels of humidity, but as it develops, it can survive of uh, in, in um, areas of uh, relative humidity of fifty-five to um, sort of degrees. Sorry, fifty-five percent relative humidity. And as I've said before, they feed from starchy materials. That's their their preferred feeding source, but they do require animal protein as well from glues and, and, and wallpaper paste and those sorts of materials. They've been identified in a museum in London where there was a costume storage uh, facility there um, and damaging some of the, the, the fabrics. So they will feed from linen, cotton as well. Um, and they have been uh, identified within a, a gallery as well in, in, in London. So although these um, and not kind of uh, a pest that we would normally consider a, a ma major issue from a public health perspective. There is the potential to damage um, high value artifacts. So <clears throat> this table here shows you the differences between them. Now, the main difference that for most of you that you'll be able to spot is looking at the length of the surci, which the surci are the two appendages that come out to the side there, okay? 
and the central caudal filament there, which is sometimes called the telson. Um, you can call it a telson or caudal filament. Now, in the grey silverfish, Tenolipisma longicordata, the telson or central filament is the same length or longer than their whole body. Okay, If that central filament or telson is shorter than half of the length of the body, it will be Lepisma saccharina, the silverfish, the common silverfish. So that's a nice, easy way to set them apart or to tell the difference there. You can see that there are some slight differences in terms of the coloration of the scales. This one's, the, the, the gray silverfish is slightly less metallic and got more of these kind of mottled colored scales, but they've also got, well, Cite is the technical term for insect hairs, if you like. Cite or hairs around the edge of the insect that are quite visible. Now, what you could do if you want to get a microscope out is look at the longest hairs around the fringe of that, that, that silverfish. And if they are barbed, those barbed hairs are another key feature of the gray silverfish. So they've got barbed hairs around the edge. The, the common silverfish, the, any hairs around it won't be barbed. Okay, so there's a difference there which you can look at if you want to look at that in more detail. Um, the fire brat, as you can see, is, is, is far more distinctive. Okay, so you've got that, that kind of mottled um, buff kind of coloration to it. Okay. Right, so bristle tails go through um, a slightly different life cycle that you might be uh, familiar with. So they go through an ametabolous life cycle, which is like incomplete metamorphosis. It's, it's where they start as an egg and then you have an immature version of um, the adult, like a bed bug or cockroach, which we would call a nymph. These immature stages, they shed their cuticle, get a bit bigger, shed their cuticle, cuticle get a bit bigger. Over time they shed their, their cuticle and grow, they, they, they get split that lengthways and they emerge out, out from there, they stretch out a bit bigger, and then their, their, their cuticle hardens up. Um, but they never stop doing this. They, it's not like a cockroach or bed bug where once they become the adult stage, they stop their development, they stop their growth. They continue to shed their cuticle throughout their life and grow and grow and get a little bit bigger each time. They become sexually mature at about the 14th stage. Okay, and if, to see that the mature ones is can't quite see it on this diagram there, but there's two smaller extra little filaments in between those long caudal filaments, and they're called stylets. Um, they are features um, of, of the um, silverfish. So once you've got those well-developed, you know it's a, a, an, an adult version of it. Now they can continue to grow and develop for up to three years, and they can shed their cuticle and develop um, up to 60 times. Um, so they never stop doing that um, throughout their life. Okay, so this is a, another gray silverfish that was found in um, a block of student um, accommodation block, basically, in Southampton in 2017. Now, initially it was um, believed that it being imported in because there was a kind of a Chinese takeaway on the ground floor there. So that was what the believed to be what was believed to be the cause. However, you know, students they often you know dry their clothes out in inside a poorly ventilated um, uh, building or a poorly ventilated um, accommodation room, um, showers, bathrooms that might be poorly ventilated and it's causing um, high levels of, of humidity there, which, which enables silverfish to thrive. And they least, they're easily transported as well, and things like corrugations and cardboard, um, all sorts of products and boxes, and yeah, they can, they, can, they can move around with goods, no problem. With this one here, I know you're probably looking at the central filament there, the telson is, is, is broken, so it, that's why it's not the full length of that one. So this is a slightly damaged specimen, but that is, is a great silverfish. 
Um, this was a silverfish that was sent into our identification uh, service. Um, so this was sent in, I believe, 2017, and it was from a domestic property in Doncaster. And this is one of the early immature stages of the grey silverfish. So as you see, these early stages is much harder to identify because they're, they're so much smaller. You know, they haven't got that, that the same scales and coloration. So then we're really looking at those hairs under a microscope and looking at those little barbs to, to, to try and identify that, that silverfish. So in Europe, um, certainly in Germany, the vast majority of silverfish problems in domestic properties are now grey silverfish. Um, it's kind of the, the norm um, for, 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 for um, guys over there for pest control companies over there to be dealing with these. And because as they've developed, they become less and less reliant on areas of high humidity. The infestation isn't necessarily just solely um, uh, linked to the bathroom or the high moisture areas. The, the problem can very quickly expand to the living areas and bedrooms of the property as well. So, then the treatment becomes more difficult. So um, whereas in the UK, when we're dealing with a, a, a common silverfish problem, the advice of dehumidifying the bathroom, putting in suitable ventilation, maybe putting in an extractor system, um, using desiccant dusts, aren't always gonna solve the problem when many of the silverfish are throughout the property. So this is a, a grey silverfish that was spotted by my colleague Matthew. Most of you will probably uh, know my colleague Matthew Davies. Um, he travelled out to um, uh, Poland uh, last year to do a to do a talk on grey silverfish um, and meet up with our colleague in Kiljan in Poland, um, Carol. And the, the evening before the event, they were they were having a meal in the restaurant. And as they were walking back to their hotel rooms, they just noticed this silverfish on the step of the hotel. And they thought, oh, that looks like a grey silverfish. So they, they picked it up. I think they took it probably back to a restaurant or a room and took a little video of it. So here we can see a grey silverfish kind of inside one of our little uh, fine lens pots. Um, and at this time, there had been no recorded sightings or no recorded um, specimens of, of grey silverfish found in Poland. Um, so our colleague Matthew went to Poland to talk about these insects, not really as they'd never been found before and found one. Now, how was that actually the first ever grey silverfish in Poland? Of course not. You know, they've already been there for a considerable period of time um, in, in all likelihood. It just so happens that they've been misidentified. And many people will have been dealing with silverfish problems that are perhaps a bit more difficult to tackle, um, which pest controllers have reported difficult silverfish problems in Poland. And we now believe it to be the grey silverfish. So, as with any control strategy, it starts with a, the most important tool that we carry as pest controllers. And um, you're all saying to your, to your laptop screens now, um, or your phones or your tablets, whatever you're watching this, this presentation on, is your torch. You know, you always have your torch with you. Um, remember, silver fish are photophobic. They move away from the light. They like dark little hidden places. They like cracks and crevices, and they like to aggregate in those little crevices. So what we need to do is get on our hands and knees. We need to look in those cracks and crevices, look around the loose lino flooring, loose skirting boards, look in the corrugations of cardboard, look behind loose or, um, or peeling wallpaper, um, edges of carpet, um, all those, those, those sorts of places. Um, boxing as well, pipe work, boxed off pipe work in bathrooms. Okay, so once we can expose them and find them in their harbourages, that's where we're looking for them. There are um, there is a, a monitoring trap um, on the market for um, grey silverfish. Um, it's not just a passive blunder trap. It does have a lure on there for both silverfish species. So you could put those in areas where you suspect silverfish might be harboring, and then use that as your 
data gathering device um, so you know you know whether the control is successful or not and hopefully uh, clear the problem so as i say gray silverfish is more resilient to draft to drying out okay more resilient which means that Yes, okay, we could probably use diatomaceous earth or dehumidification as part of a control strategy, but we can't necessarily rely on it. They may well survive that treatment um, because, as I say, they can survive at air conditions of relative humidity at 55%, um, whereas the common silverfish, once you lower the humidity below 70%, then that environment becomes inhospitable to them and they're not going to survive um, for, for that long, okay? So remember, they're more resilient to desiccation. There is an insecticidal bait, um, which is um, on the market now, which is used for cockroach control and it contains um, a neonicotinoid um, insecticide called clothianidine. Um, which is a, a new kind of active ingredient in the UK. It's been used in other countries for, for quite some time, um, but it works um, as an edible bait product. So it's something that the silverfish is going to consume. Now, it would work on cockroaches in the same way in that cockroach feed from that bait and other cockroaches feed from, from the dead cockroaches, and then you get that secondary or effect or that, or that cascade effect. With silverfish, it's slightly different because silverfish don't tend to eat their dead. They will eat dead insects um, to get, again, to get some of the proteins that they need for development, but they don't have that active behavior of eating their dead. What they will do is as they encounter the insecticidal bait, they will consume it as, a, as, a, as an opportunity, as an easy opportunity to them. So when you are applying insecticidal bait product, you need to put multiple baiting points down directly where they're harboring. Okay, so the old phrase of take the poison to the pest, which is something that Mike mentioned earlier with mouse control, um, take the poison to the pest is, is important because they're not necessarily gonna seek out to feed from the bait. You need to actually get the bait to them. So lots of small um, Baiting points is, is important when you're using um, this, this particular product. Um, so this is the, the one, there's the one bait product that has that HSC approval for grey silverfish. So it states on the label grey silverfish. Okay, so again, this is why identification of the insect is important. So we know that the products we use to control the problem and the methods we use are going to have the results that we expect. So, yeah, already did that. So, yeah, they will feed from bait when they account for the product. And in order for that sort of treatment to work, you must apply it properly. Good. So that's that's the grey silverfish element of it. I thought I'd, I'd, I'd throw in some stuff on other insects as well that we often associate with dampness or humidity. Um, so here we've got book lice. There's about 2,000 species of book lice and they can be quite varied in appearance because there are some species that are winged, okay, that two pairs of wings, like winged book lice down, down here, okay, with this quite clear striking venation on them. And then the ones we can encounter most commonly, particularly within buildings in damp areas, are, is the, um, you know, the wingless book lice, okay. So book lice are all in an order called Socoptera, which means um, rub something rubbing with wings because the damage they cause again sort of scratching the surface of 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 plaster and uh, paper which has got little microscopic molds and spores and fungus on there is the damage they cause it's like something's being rubbed away um, so yeah it comes from the Greek word socos rubbed um, or or gnawed so. Book lice, then again, they're there because of the presence of microscopic molds, funguses, spores that are only there because of the environmental conditions enabling them to grow, enabling them to grow. So that's that's high levels of humidity, dampness. So the treatment should focus on drying the area out. 
reducing the humidity levels. They're very soft bodied, bodied insects as well. So the application of desiccant dust, so diatomaceous earth, for example, in the cracks and crevices and areas where they're harboring will be particularly effective at, at killing these soft bodied insects that are very, very susceptible to dehydration. Other sorts of things that they'll attack, so, you know, damp milk powder, for example. So they can be a pest of food production and food storage facilities, where a bit of dampness on dried ingredients such as flour or particularly milk powder is a very common one, um, what they'll attack. They, you get those molds and spores and fungus on the product, um, and then they, they, can, they can very rapidly ex expand. Um, read on that. Um, another thing with book lice as well is that book lice are parthenogenic, which means that they, they don't need males, they don't have males, they, they, they reproduce without, um, without sex basically, so they, they, the females can just continue to reproduce without, without males. So um, anyway, just another little interesting, interesting fact on book lice. Um, insect specimens as well, so many of us might keep a little stash of insect specimens for training purposes, um, and I certainly have a big stash of insects that I keep for, for training, co um, uh, training courses. And if they're stored in damp conditions, get them easily at moulds and fungus on them and book lice will damage and attack those. Wallpaper, um, wallpaper paste, so loose wallpaper, that's all dampness as well. If you've got rising damp in a property, sometimes solving the damp problem in the property, could be part of that control strategy. So that might require a specialist company to come in and deal with the damp issue. Again, baby formula um, is, is also spillages in a kitchen cupboard, perhaps. Bird nesting material. There's all sorts of um, insects that we can get from bird nesting material. Um, and again, we can get book lice from there. Um, and then again, this is damp damage caused by excessive dampness, rising damp in a property. Um, which, I, which I mentioned already. Plaster beetles then, so we find these attacking the, the same sorts of, um, or find them in the same sorts of areas. So these are, there's a couple of different families of plaster beetles. You get fungus beetles, and, and these are plaster beetles that are in the family called Lathrididae. Now plaster beetles are quite distinctive by their kind of what we call striations, the long grooves along the wing casing the elytra or wing casing there. And they've got little oval indentations all between those grooves there, okay? So that's a, a, a good key feature for plaster beetles. And they've got large, in large segments at the ends of the antenna. The antenna is clubbed with large segments at the end. And with the family Lethrididae, if you've got two large segments at the end, it's a male, and the females have three large segments like this one here. This would be a female, okay? Um, again, they're fungus feeders. They're there because they're feeding from all these little microscopic spores, molds, and fungus that are only there due to the presence of dampness and levels of high humidity. So the control strategy is the same. Desiccation of the insect, dry the area out. Um, and they're often a, a pest of new built buildings where or the, the moisture that's within the brickwork or the mortar in, in the structure of the building um, is still there in that new built building because the, the building contractor hasn't allowed enough time for the building to dry out properly. Um, even in the plaster, wet plaster, again, they need time to dry out. And quite often now, properties are not given sufficient time to dry out properly. And that enables insects such as plaster beetles and book lice to, to, to survive and thrive in that property. So I was saying control, thorough housekeeping is important. Okay, that's a, that they will feed from, um, or certainly um, silverfish will feed from certain dead insects as well, and other food debris that might be lying around, say, you know, under the kitchen sink, for example. So thorough housekeeping, discard infested commodities. So if we've got book lice feeding from molds in, you know, a uh, sack of milk powder, then that needs to be isolated and destroyed. 
things that can be done to prevent that buildup of moisture or condensation in, in the property. So installation of adequate air ventilation systems in a bathroom, making sure that the customer is not keeping the window closed constantly and that they're opening it to allow some airflow into that property. Um, making sure there's maybe trickle vents on the top of a window, with little air vent around the window to allow you know, moisture to escape from the building. Dehumidify the area so you can you know, hire a dehumidifier, or get the customer can dry the area out, dehumidify the area. In some cases, it might require a damp proofing survey to solve that problem, and then in turn, that will solve the inset problem. Diatomaceous earth are you know, particularly effective on those insects that are soft bodied and require um, high levels of humidity to survive because they're more prone to that, that desiccation. Okay, so the application of diatomaceous earth. And that's me done. Um, so what I'm going to do, guys, I'm going to stop sharing. Uh, hopefully, Natalie is still there. I'm here. <laughs> Hi, Natalie. You all right? Yeah, good. Yeah, we've got some questions for you. We've got six at the moment. I'm sure they'll start uh, racking up now as well. So okay. we will get on to those. We've got a good 10, 15 minutes for them as well. So... Okay, Nathan Biggs here. He says, do new gel baits on the market work for silverfish and grey silverfish? This was probably a bit earlier on before you covered it, but just to sort of go over it again, that'll be great. Yeah, so um, I, I've spoken to the, manu well, you know, the manufacturer about this, um, and the authorization that's issued on it is solely for the grey silverfish. So if you were to use it on the common silverfish, technically you're using it off-label, um, so again, this is why I one of the other reasons why identification of the species is important because you know you'll be going off label uh, and, and breaching BPR or, 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 or controlled pesticides regs if if you use it on the wrong species. So it is important that you use it on the right species that is on the label. All right. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I remember seeing that on there as well when it first sort of come about. You know, noticed that it was just for the grey silverfish, but uh, yeah, we'll keep an eye on that, haven't we? Yeah. Great. Um, I think this should make sense to you. So, do you know of anywhere that these or other silverfish are kept in culture? Um, no. Um, I I don't, if I'm honest. Um. It's okay no. if you don't. I think it's one of those obscure questions. You know, yeah, new one. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Now, if anybody does, then please put a put, put a comment in the questions bit, and I'll uh, I'll read it out. But no, me neither. Okay, so Elijah Patterson, you said adults do not require high humidities. Does this mean they will migrate away, or will they still stay in those high humidity areas? Yeah. So basically, it's it's it, it's only the the very early stages of the grey si silverfish that require that high level of relative humidity. Um, and a study that was done in Norway um, showed that large numbers of the population um, were found in other areas of the property. So the bedrooms, the living areas, um, away from considerable areas away from the considerable areas away from the bathroom. So traditionally, when you get called out for dealing with silverfish, it's right straight to the bathroom you know that's where you're going to find them let's look around the loose tiles let's pull the bath panel off let's find those little damp areas or where there's a little bit of silicon sealant it's come away water's run down we've got dampness there but with this one you're going to find silverfish in other areas of the property yeah the majority of the population will still be in the bathroom but they're going to be in other areas as well so and that makes it easier for them to be transported so you think about the student that's going to be going out back to university mm -hmm. They're venturing out into their belongings, into the cardboard boxes, and then they get they get spread around. So I think part of that behaviour as well also means that there's an increased likelihood that they can be spread through movement of mm -hmm. people's belongings. Absolutely, yeah. If they think if people get one some obscure issues or them popping up in places where they wouldn't normally see them, they need to think about the grey silverfish, don't they? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, there was a question here. I'm just going to 
I think you've already answered just in the last one about um, the product and whether it's got the common silverfish on the label. We already answered that as, you know, no, unfortunately, at the minute. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if, if you are going to use um, an insecticide on the mother, then diatomaceous earth, yourself. Um, I mean, there are there are some uh, insecticidal dust that's got permethrin in or there's, an, there's another new one on the market now, which has got a natural pyrethrum in mm. it as well, insecticidal dust. That would be my preference because remember that they, they like damp areas and if you start spraying a wettable powder or a suspension concentrate it you know you're increasing the dampness on you um if you spray them directly yeah you're going to kill off those insects but mm. i would i would i would try and go for a dry dust option before before using um a, you know a, a, a spray as a pyrethroid mm -hmm. and again as with everything, you just got to check the label that is authorised for that insect as well. Absolutely, it's always a general statement I have on everything we do. Read the label. <laughs> yeah. Um, great. Um, I think it's more of a um, uh, a compliment to your personality here. How does Melvin even make silverfish sound interesting? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've just spotted um, that one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I had to read that one out. So, um, and then Nathan Biggs here. So, parts of my question have been answered, but just wanted to confirm uh, the gel bait can't be used in all silverfish. So, yeah, we've got that. Got that again. That's a big question out there, I think, for everybody. Um, uh, and then, yeah, so you've probably seen that as well from Jihad. Is, are there any bio agents? Is there yeah, any bio agents? Is it, uh, by bio agents, we would normally sort of think, well, biological mm -hmm. means pest control, like using a parasite. Or something mm. like that but mm -hmm. you know not not in public health pest control there is nothing that we have in terms of using another or living organism against it um if you mean a chemical way of dealing with them then there are pyre synthetic pyrethroids um some you know pyrethroid dust there's pyrethroid sprays that will be labeled for crawling insects or silverfish so again check the label all right. Mm -hmm. So hopefully, I've, I I think I know what you mean by that, and hopefully I've I've covered that. I think so. Yeah. No, I think I think that's that's spot on. Um, great. That's all the questions you can probably see, Melvin. That's uh, fabulous, and thank you very much again for yeah your your informative and very well produced uh, presentation, our silverfish. Thank you. All right. Cheers, guys. Thank you very much. All right. Take care, Melvin. Cheers, thank Melvin. you. Bye. Bye.